Um, you know, what do you think of, of Wilkes' scheme? You know, it's a four, three front. I think one of the things that made him, you know, a good fit here in San Francisco is just that I think the Niners, they really like Chris Kosarek and they like their wide nine defensive front. And they, you know, Vic Fangio rumors, uh, had a lot of, how, you know, were given a lot of credence here, but I think Vic is kind of historically a three, four, um, you know, he, he prefers that 34 front. What did you think of Steve's defense throughout the year? Well, you got to remember, one, it was a very young defense, and you saw Brian Burns really develop from a pass rusher who he knew had a great first step and could get the quarterback to somebody who could really stand up against the run. I thought he played real well against the run. Derek Brown was the breakout, breakout star defensively this year on the interior of the D-line. Frankie Louvu had one of the best seasons for a linebacker in the NFL this season. It flew under the radar. Shaq Thompson, solid. And then on the back end, um, you saw what uh, J.C. Horn could do before he got hurt. They had some injuries. You lost your top two corners by season's end. You had some injuries up front. You had some injuries on the back end. Um, But I thought defensively, they they just had an identity under Steve Wilkes. It was a physical, tough brand of football. Um, And again, part of that is complementary football, too, where You know, as good as the Panthers might have been in their top 11 on defense, they're not as deep as, say, the 49ers are, where you can be down a couple of guys and next man up, uh, there's not much of a drop-off. That wasn't the case in Carolina. And so you found a way to play complementary football. You run the ball, you pound it, you play behind your big offensive line, you take as much of the clock up as you can, and you let that defense be fresh. And when they were able to implement that game plan, uh, generally the outcome was pretty good. The the traits, I mean, just looking at some of the numbers, comparing him to D'Amico Ryan's, it looks like Wilkes' defenses tend to, to blitz a little bit more, uh, at least than D'Amico had here in San Francisco. Of course, D'Amico has Nick Bosa and Eric Armstead, so yeah. maybe he's trying to get it done with his front four and, and drop seven. But it's also kind of thought that, um, you know, the Niners have historically played a lot of zone here and that, that uh, you know, Wilkes does like to play a little zone defense or a lot of zone defense and may even, per, you know, prefer that single high look, the cover three, which would put Talanoa Hafanga, you know, right there in that position up on the line of scrimmage, kind of a lurker against the run um, where he is so strong. What are the traits that you've noticed um, of, a, of a Steve Wilkes defense? Yeah, again, I think if the Panthers had a Hufanga, you probably would have seen more of that. They just didn't have that ball hawking safety that you want. That is on the shopping list for the offseason. Um, what you'll see from a Steve Wilkes defense, they're generally disciplined. They don't commit a lot of penalties. And where you'll see the young players, I think you'll see growth and you'll see development from them. You know, scheme-wise, um, you know, they play a lot of nickel. Uh, they were in a lot of base 4-3 as well. Now, from the from the blitzing standpoint, uh, part of the reason you had to blitz more is there was so much attention on Brian Burns, and you lost a Hassan Reddick in the offseason. We're all seeing what he's doing now with Philadelphia, so you got to get that pressure somewhere. It was easier to do that last year when you had Reddick and Burns. Uh, this year you got a little bit more from the middle from uh, Derek Brown, but the other edge, they didn't get a ton of pressure unless it was bringing Frankie Louvu, a linebacker. So a lot of that was personnel-based. And, and to me, that was Steve Wilkes' strength. Now, after the first game, they assessed, this is what we have. We're not going to try to say this is what we do if the pieces don't fit. We're going to build the puzzle according to the pieces that we have. And that's coaching. You know, some coaches come in. This is what I run. You see it in college. We're going to do this no matter what. Well, You know, the the guys that you inherit are a bunch of option guys. Um, You can't go spread and play air raid, (laughs) right? (laughs) Right. Steve Wilkes basically said, what's our strength? How can we win? And, again, it was complementary football. A lot of it goes back to the offensive side where they said, we've got to run the ball. We've got a big, heavy hammer in Deontay Foreman. We've got a big O-line. That can take some pressure off the defense. Keep the D fresh. A part of the struggles early on in the first four or five games the defense would get worn down in the fourth quarter. So the Panthers would be in all these games. The defense then just played too many snaps, and part of the reason was the offense couldn't stay out on the field long enough uh, to give the defense a breather. So they sort of figured out that formula. I thought that was his biggest strength, really assessing, hey, this is where we're good, and now let's build a scheme around that instead of doing it the other way around. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You know, I saw an interview with uh, Brian Burns done in Vegas at the site of the Pro Bowl 
festivities, if you will. And, and um, he was asked about Steve Wilkes by a, you know, Bay area media person. And, and his comment was really interesting to me because he said, you know, Steve is a guy who cares as much about his players as people as he does uh, about his players as football players or key cogs in his defense. And, you know, that really kind of hit home. I don't know how much uh, it, you know time you had around Coach Wilkes, but did you get a feel for his personality and how he yeah. interacts with his players? Um, I did see an end-of-the-year video. I guess it was after the last game where he gave the kicker the, the game ball. And you can kind of see that, you know, losing teams sometimes fracture. You know that. I mean, whether – and regardless of sport. And it just seemed like a very united – room at the end of the year despite the fact there were some struggles this was a team that was one and four when Matt Rule was fired they lose the next game one and five interim head coach that can easily spiral into a four three win season we've seen that plenty of times in the NFL yet this team was able to stay the course and again almost made the playoffs one of the things I got from the players in the locker room where they really respected Steve. They said, he's not going to try to be your buddy or your pal and tell you what you want to hear. He will tell you the truth. He'll be your friend, but your friend tells you the truth. And that was the message in the locker room when Steve Wilkes took over. If you're not doing something, I'm going to tell you. There was an accountability. And, and not saying that that wasn't there under Matt Rule. It just seemed more streamlined. It just seemed more direct. Uh, the, the communication seemed more effective. And the players were galvanized by him. And, and you brought up the kicker getting the game ball. The backstory to that is Steve Wilkes' third game as head coach. The Panthers are in Atlanta. They hit a 62-yard touchdown in the final seconds of regulation. DJ Moore removes his helmet, so there's a penalty on the ensuing point after. Eddie Pinheiro, the kicker, still kicking indoors, but now from 48 instead of 35 or whatever it was, he misses the kick. The game goes into overtime. In overtime, the Panthers get an interception. They return it you know, down inside the 20 of Atlanta. Pinheiro has another chance to win the game, and he misses a field goal that was shorter than an extra point. And there were all these calls to cut Eddie Pinheiro. Let him go. He was a replacement kicker to begin with. The only reason he made the team was because Zane Gonzalez got hurt in the final preseason game. Cut Eddie, cut Eddie, cut Eddie. And Steve Wilkes very emphatically said right after the game, Eddie's our kicker. They did not bring in another kicker to come and even compete and try out. Next game, they lose to Cincinnati. But after that fiasco in Atlanta, Eddie Pinheiro did not miss another kick the rest of the season. And in the final game of the season, he hits the game winner against New Orleans. And at the time, it felt like that was a kick that could potentially have delivered Steve Wilkes the head coaching job. And it meant so much to Wilkes. It meant so much to Eddie Pinheiro. And so much to everybody in the locker room. But again, that's the belief in the player. Hey, he's our guy. We're not going to wait two days. We're going to say it right after the game. And that conviction from Steve Wilkes, that's the messaging I'm talking about. That resonated throughout the locker room. And this was a different team over the last 12 games than it was in the first five games. You know, that is an interesting anecdote for sure. You, you uh, yeah, mentioned before that Wilkes played collegiately at App State as a, as a defensive back. I'm just kind of wondering personnel wise, is there any, you know, some guys, some uh, coaches, whether they're offensive coaches or defensive coaches are associated with a particular position group. Like, Hey, this coach really prefers big receivers or big corners or, you know, first round corners or, um, you know, huge bodies, uh, you know, up front at defensive tackle or, or incredible edge speed or whatever traits that defensive coordinator sometimes likes. Uh, he might see a, a, a common denominators in their defenses over, over the years. Are there personnel tendencies that, that uh, Coach Wilkes has that you've noticed? It's hard to say because he inherited a roster that wasn't his. Uh, he, he was working with what was there. And when he took over, Jeremy Chin, the star safety, is out six weeks with a hamstring injury. Then you lose Dante Jackson, your number two corner, to an Achilles. J.C. Horn was banged up most of the season. Uh, so, again, it wasn't like he could go out shopping and get his guys. He'll have more control, I think, over personnel on the defensive side with an entire offseason in San Francisco. You know, you come in midseason. Remember, it wasn't like he had been with the team for the past few years. 
He was hired in the offseason to coach the defensive backs. So he hadn't been there long enough. And it's, hey, this is what you have. These are the cards <laughs> that you're dealt with. And you know, let's see how far you can get. And then I made the analogy on the air a bunch. If you're a poker player, this was somebody who was basically dealt, you know, six, seven hands in a row of two, seven offsuit and ended up bluffing his way to the final table and got heads up against the big stack and almost had the big stack blinking. That's what Steve Wilkes did. So when we talk about personnel, what he could do in San Francisco may be vastly different or significantly different than what he did in Carolina, where he'll probably have, again, an offseason to evaluate. These are the pieces that we have. How do we want to deploy them versus, okay, we're in the middle of a season. you got to figure out how to make this into chicken salad.